I think we are good to go to the next part. Um, so the next part is the Audible challenge. I believe we were uh, we are going to listen to something from Audible and answer these two questions. So yeah, let's go. Congratulations. You're about to hear direct from the horse's mouth how to interview better. Not from a recruiter, not from a human resources individual, but directly from a person who has made all hiring decisions for my staff over the last 20 years. Hiring managers make all final decisions. All other roles involved in the interview process are support roles, not decision makers. This book is about giving you a highly condensed summary of the most important things you need to know to not only interview well, but to have an advantage over other candidates. I want to prevent you from making mistakes I've seen over the course of my hiring career that have caused qualified candidates to not get the job offer. It is meant to be immediately useful and to reinforce the basics that will help you land your next job. You should be able to review and internalize the key material in this book within 15 minutes. This book is not a 300-page guide to interviewing. I think those are a waste of time. Often they are written by recruiters or human resources personnel who, quite honestly, have no say in whether someone is hired. They may control whether your resume gets to the hiring manager, but at the end of the day, the hiring manager makes the decision. That's why you should listen to one. Reading through hundreds of questions and answers won't prepare you better. In fact, I would argue that will only confuse you and create a jumble of information you'll try to remember during the interview and end up getting flustered. Do you really want to read through 101 interview questions and try to remember how to respond to each one? Interviewing well and getting the job offer isn't something that requires hours of learning. There are only a few critical things I consistently see candidates doing wrong, and if you understand those, you will fare better than other candidates who don't have this insight. In my more than two decades in the high-tech industry, I've been a director, senior director, and vice president at several companies, ranging from Fortune 500 companies like Microsoft to small startups. Crazy interviews are like bad auditions for a talent show, and I've experienced many. All right, that was the um, audio clip from Audible. Um, so the questions are, so the first question is, the book is discussing how to interview better, uh, yes or no. And the second question is, the book teaches you how to have an advantage over other candidates. So again, yes or no. Okay, so... Um, for the first question, uh, yes, won by 88%. And for the second question, yes, also won by 91%. So let's go to our instructors. Let's see what you guys think. I do agree with, uh, with Audience again, because in the first one, they said uh, this book is discussing how to interview better, not recruiting, not human resources. So it's true. And the second one is also yes. Yeah, I'd say this seems uh, pretty straightforward. Um, both of them um, somewhat teaches, um, tell you or teach you about yeah, uh, each of the questions, uh, how to interview better and how to have an advantage. So um, I'd say I, I agree with the majority. Obviously, Yusuf, as a seventh grader, you've been through so many interviews. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> What are some other responses? Or do we just like all agree on this? Yeah, we definitely, yeah, okay. I think we definitely all agree. Definitely agree. Yes. They state both of these things at the very beginning of the video, but then even afterwards repeatedly say interview and advantage and how this is going to be just awesome um, and help you do these things. That basically was the whole audio clip and saying yeah. this repeatedly. So it was quite clear. And for once we got all the students basically in the, above 90 percent so we don't need to uh we don't need to pass, I guess the students got it yeah i agree i feel like i should get my hands on this book but yeah <laughs> yeah do um, you know the name of the book by, by any chance i can ask and get back to you later but yeah okay 
Let's move on to the next part of the um, session. So the next part is the TOEFL challenge. Um, I believe we were we are going to listen to also an audio clip and answer some questions. So um, let's go. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. So that's how elephants use infrasound. Now let's talk about the other end of the acoustical spectrum, sound that's too high for humans to hear, ultrasound. Ultrasound is used by many animals that detect, and some of them send out, very high-frequency sounds. So what's a good example? Yes, Carol? Well, bats. Since they're all blind, bats have to use sound for, uh, you know, to keep from flying into things. That's echolocation. Echolocation is pretty self-explanatory. Using echoes, reflected sound waves, to locate things. As Carol said, bats use it for navigation and orientation. And what else? Mike? Well, finding food is always important. And, uh, I guess, not becoming food for other animals. <laughs> right, on both counts. Avoiding other predators and locating prey. Um, typically insects that fly around at night. Now, before I go on, let me just respond to something Carol was saying, this idea that bats are blind. Actually, there are some species of bats, the ones that don't use echolocation, that do rely on their vision for navigation. But it is true that for many bats, their vision is too weak to count on. Okay, so quick summary of how echolocation works. The bat emits these ultrasonic pulses, very high-pitched sound waves that we can't hear. And then they analyze the echoes, how the waves bounce back. Uh, here, let me finish this diagram I started before class. So the bat sends out these pulses, very focused bursts of sound, and echoes bounce back. You know, I don't think I need to draw in the echoes. You're, you're reading assignment for the next class. It has a diagram that shows this very clearly. So anyway, as I was saying, by analyzing these echoes, the bat can determine, say, if there's a wall in a cave that it needs to avoid and how far away it is. Another thing it uses ultrasound to detect is the size and shape of objects. For example, one echo they'd quickly identify is the one they associate with a moth, which is common prey for a bat, particularly a moth beating its wings. However, moths happen to have a major advantage over most other insects. They can detect ultrasound. This means that when a bat approaches, the moth can detect the bat's presence. So it has time to escape to safety or else they can just remain motionless, since um, when they stop beating their wings, they'd be much harder for the bat to distinguish from, oh, uh, a leaf or, or some other object. Now, we've tended to underestimate just how sophisticated the abilities of animals that use ultrasound are. In fact, we kind of assumed that they were filtering a lot out, uh, the way a sophisticated radar system can ignore echoes from stationary objects on the ground. Radar does this to remove ground clutter, information about um, hills or buildings that it doesn't need. But bats, we thought they were filtering out this kind of information because they simply couldn't analyze it. But it looks as if we were wrong. Recently, there was this experiment with trees and a specific species of bats, a bat called the lesser spear-nosed bat. Now, a tree should be a huge acoustical challenge for a bat, right? I mean, it's got all kinds of surfaces with different shapes and angles. So, well, the echoes from a tree are going to be a mass of chaotic acoustic reflections, right? Not like the echo from a moth. So we thought for a long time that bats stopped their evaluation at simply, that's a tree. Yet it turns out that that bats, or at least this particular species, can not only tell that it's a tree, but can also distinguish between, say, a pine tree and a deciduous tree, like a maple or an oak tree, just by their leaves. Okay, I guess that was then. So let's see, the first question is, um, elephants are using ultrasound waves. It's a yes or no question. 
Um, and the second question is, bats are using ultrasound as an echolocation technique. Again, this is also a yes or no um, question. Um, not gonna lie, this whole um, audio clip reminded me of my elementary school, middle school, and high school career <laughs> all at once. <laughs> okay, so the answers are in. Um, first question, um, yes, won by 57%. Um, second question, yes, also won by 86%. Let's go to our instructors. Yeah, it's, the first question was tricky. Uh, but I'm going to disagree with uh, the 57% of the student that said yes. Uh, at the very beginning of the video, like the first sentence, uh, it said, that's how elephants use infrasound waves or, or something like it was, uh, it was not ultrasound. It was uh, infrasound, which might have sounded the same. Uh, but, but it is different. And the second question, it is a correct 86% uh, got it right. It is uh, the bats use ultrasound as an echo location technique. Because I think, I'm not sure, but I think bats are blind or, or they can't really see or something. But I'm not a biologist. Hey, Emily, you're a biologist. Tell us more about bats. <laughs> not an animal biologist, but... Uh, I think you're right. I think like the, the and I mean, it, these questions, that question is a little easier because I kind of knew about it. They send the little sound and it comes back, but they explain that in the video kind of what that echo location is. So it's helpful for that question when they go on to explain what something is instead of just stating it. And I would agree with you that that first question is tricky. It was right when the video started and it was infrasound, but it said it very quietly almost. Like you could tell it was, and this is an interesting audio clip because it was going from something and transitioning into another subject. And that was how the beginning of the video was designed. And I could see like, you'd really have to be paying attention. So that was a little tricky. Yeah, that, that was, um, uh, in the beginning I heard elephants, uh, uh, elephants are using um, something. I don't even remember at this point, but I know it wasn't ultrasound waves because I, I started thinking right after I heard that, I was like, do elephants use ultrasound waves? And I was kind of just, I, it threw me off. Well, when I saw the answers, it kind of threw me off. I was like, so am I right or am I wrong? I, I'm just so confused. And then, and then, uh, so yeah, that's that's how I felt about the first one. And then the second one, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's it. I agree with the 86%. Also, I like how whenever I start doing a Zoom, someone's either mowing their lawn or using a leaf blower outside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I have to say that, that uh, this time I, I don't agree with the audience so because elephants are using infrasound to communicate with each other uh, over long distance. So uh, first one was like, uh, yes, uh, was no. And the second one is true, yeah. Yeah, we, so we, we agree. Okay, so the first one is no, the second one is, is yes. But we, we had this conversation because if I, if I had to trust what I heard, I would have given the wrong answer because because at the very beginning I, I think that I heard ultrasound. Then I googled that and I was like, no, I, I remember something that they use like the lower frequencies, so infrasound. But if I had just to go with what I think that I heard, I would have put in the wrong answer. So I would have put in yes. Um, so that was tricky. Uh, yeah, definitely. Also, ultrasound. They were saying that ultrasound is like the high frequency that bats use. So elephants and bats wouldn't be using the same method mm. of you know to hear or anything like that so that's what that that kind of would help you out um to differentiate the two the two of them i guess you can say that elephants have big ears to <laughs> to be used with ultrasound <laughs> they're too big <laughs> the place <laughs> i didn't imagine they used any kind of sound i figured with those ears they could just you know hear you would imagine <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that was a very tricky question. Um, fun discussion as well. So yeah, um, I guess we can move to the next part. Um, I believe the next part is the, um, yes, another um, TOEFL audio clip. So yeah, let's go. Listen to a conversation between a student 
and a registrar.、Uh, hi, I'd like to drop off my graduation form. I-, I understand you need this in order to process my diploma. Okay, I'll take that.、Um, before you leave, let me check our computer.、Uh, looks like you're okay for graduation. And, hmm. Actually, I'm getting a warning flag on your academic record here. Really? Yeah. Let's see what's what.、Uh, okay. Are you familiar with our graduation requirements?、Uh, I think so. Well, then you know you need 48 credits in your major field to graduate, and at least 24 credits at the intermediate level or higher. Also, after your second year, you have to meet with your department chair to outline a plan for the rest of your time here. In the past, we also issued letters before a student's final year began to let them know what they needed to take in their final year to be okay, but we don't do that anymore. I definitely met with my chairperson two years ago.、Uh, he told me that I needed eight more courses at the intermediate level or higher in the last two years to be okay.、Uh, so I'm not sure what the problem is. I, I made sure I got those credits. Unfortunately, the computer's usually pretty reliable. So, I'm not sure what's going on here. It could be that I've taken two basic courses, but coupled both of them with、uh, field experiences. What do you mean? Well, I could only take intro courses because there were no intermediate level courses available for those particular topics. My chairperson told me that if I did independent field research in addition to the assigned work in each course,、uh, they would count as intermediate level courses. Uh, my classmates,、um, well, some of my classmates did this for an easy way to meet their intermediate course requirement.、Uh, but I did it to get the kind of depth in those topics I was going for.、And、as it turned out, I really enjoyed the field work. It was a nice supplement to just sitting and listening to lectures. I'm sure that's true, but the computer's still showing them as basic level courses, despite the field work.、Uh, I'm not sure what to do then. I, I mean,. Should I cancel my graduation party? No, no reason to get worried like that. Just contact your chairperson immediately, okay?、Uh, tell him to call me as soon as possible so that we can verify your fieldwork arrangement and certify those credits right away. It's not like there's an actual deadline today or anything, but if more than a few weeks go by, we might have a real problem that would be very difficult to fix in time for you to graduate. In fact, there probably would be nothing we could do. I'll get on that. Okay, so that was the end of that clip.、Um, so the questions are、um, the first one is a registrar is an administrative executive within an academic institution who oversees the management and leadership of the registrar's office. So, true or false?、Um, and the second question is the registrar. Uh, proposed a good solution for the student's problem at the end of the conversation. Again, this is a true or false、um, question. So, yeah. Okay, so the results are in.、Um, first question, true won by 72%.、Um, second question, true also won by 79%. Let's see if our instructors agree or disagree.、Um, so, I'm, I'm biased again. I'm very biased in all of these.、Um, I worked for the registrar's office when I was in college. So,、um, the registrar, yes, the first one is true. The registrar is the administrative executive who oversees the registrar's office.、Um, they get paid a lot of money. Good job.、Um, the second one, I, okay. And I guess the other instructors will have to. Come in on this with me.、Um, I think it's false, but also true.、Um, I think the registrar is going to help them with their problem, but that student needs to first go to their advisor and get something sorted out and then come back to the registrar's office. Like they need to go somewhere else to get the first problem solved and then come back, and then the registrar can help them. But I'm not sure if I understood that correctly myself. Yeah, he needs like, to go and get the credit、uh, for the, for, for the, get some certification so they get, could get the credit for the field work.、Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I guess, I guess it's true, the second one, because at the end of the day, that's a, you know, it's a better solution than do I need to cancel my bachelor party? Uh, uh, sorry. Go on, go on. I think you can go. 
Uh, I agree with Emily. The first question is true. But when it comes to second question, I again agree with Emily because I heard she tried to help, but at the end she said that uh, you need to contact your chairperson. Otherwise, we can't do anything else. So that's what I heard. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. I think it's false. Yeah. Um, so the, the first part, uh, no clue. Absolutely no clue. Still in seventh grade. But um, the second part, <laughs> uh, second part, I, I guess it would ha- it was half and half because she, to help him, he needs to go to someone else and then give uh, clarification and then she can help him. So um, I guess since there's only two options, I go with the majority, but um, if there was, if there was a middle option, I'd most likely go with that. It gives, it, it leaves a lot of space for interpretation of the second one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess everyone's confused for the second one. But yeah, the first one is very straightforward. Also, Emily, um, I also worked for the registrar office for a period of time. So (laughs) it's a good place to work when you're in college. It is. But yeah, I guess we can move on if we have nothing else to say. 